these are the few things I'm going to talk about here today, a little bit of theory, theory like the guidelines, what the actually guidelines say about sedation and, and, and uh, pain management in the ICU and what we're actually doing. Talk a bit about the physiological consequences of sedatives, specifically the cardiovascular effects and the depression of their central nervous system leading to uh, um, depression of the respiratory drive and diaphragm and other risk and, and its effects on the diaphragm and other respiratory muscles. The new concept of lung and diaphragm protective ventilation, which, which uh, has, has just showed up lately in the uh, literature and some alternative approaches to treat a reduced diaphragmatic uh, weakness. So the, the, the current guidelines are the latest guidelines. Uh, are the, the, the ones, the one that I'm citing here was published in 2018 basically 40 people, which included four critical illness survivors, and they issued 37 recommendations. Uh, of course, I will not go through all of them, but I'm just gonna pinch, uh, sucked a few of them. And, and what they say eventually was, uh, what they suggest eventually is that propofol and dexmedidomidine should be used, should be preferred over benzodiazepines. Uh, they don't make a statement, uh, there's no a specific statement, uh, making anything that uh saying anything that propofol would be superior or inferior to dexmedetomidine and they also suggest the use of adjuvant opioids uh, to treat pain but what we're actually doing at the bad side it's um so in this paper in 2019 in five icus in peru they analyzed almost uh, 1400 patients in 20,000 icu days and they did see that these patients uh, most of the 25% uh, of the patients on by day four, they were taking one gram of metazolam. And then uh, uh, roughly uh, um, by day seven, uh, the cumulative dose of fentanyl was almost 17 milligrams, uh, uh, the median. So we are using a lot of benzos and, and opioids. And, and later, earlier this year, uh, uh, Lowe's and colleagues, they sent this, they, they published this paper in, in um, Annals of Intensive Care. I, I responded actually to this, to this questionnaire when I was still back in Brazil. Um, actually, uh, they were asking about how we are managing pain, agitation, sedation um, in ICU patients. And what they came up with is that for pain management, uh, uh, fentanyl and morphine, they're still the most prevalent ones and Tylenol is just the third one and diperone is, is, is the fifth, and tramadol would be the fourth year. And, and the use of alternative uh, non-pharmacological strategies is less than, uh, is using less than half of the patients or less than half of the ICUs. What they, act, what they saw as well, what they reported is that uh, how we were sedating these patients uh, under mechanical ventilation. So you can see that midaz is more than 80% and followed by propofol and dexmedetomidine. And the same, the, the same when we're dealing with severe, moderate to severe ERDS and with uh, patients with septic shock, midazolam is, is always the first one followed by, by fentanyl and propofol. And the, 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 this picture only changes when we are looking at non-invasive ventilation. And that's when dexmedetomidine uh, is more used than haloperidol and ketaibi. So whenever we are looking at uh, pros and cons of uh, sedatives and analgesia, of course, we're all looking to treat pain, pain, anxiety, and achieve some ventilator synchrony. But we, are, uh, we also have the, the adverse effects of uh, sedatives, which is vasopressors, uh, the, uh, uh, the depression of the central nervous system, and uh, increased length of mechanical ventilation. And what would, would like in reality, of course, would be the balance be, be, between these two. And then I, I think that the, this is the reason why we, we, we chose to, to put this, this table and, and, and basically to show that like the, all, all the drugs we, we give to sedate patients or most of the drugs we give to, 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 to sedate patients and to treat uh, uh, anxiety, they do cause uh, uh, um, some sort of cardiovascular um, effect that we usually treat with presses and fluids, and that wears off usually when we turn off the sedation. Now, when, whenever we depress the central nervous system and, and, and consequently we depress the respiratory drive, then we can see that this leads to intubation. Of, uh, if the patient is already intubated, this prolongs the mechanical ventilation and eventually leads to diaphragmatic weakness. 
Um, now the control of sedation, uh, sorry, the control uh, uh, of sedation, the link between con uh, sedation and control of breathing, it goes through several different uh, mechanisms, right? So they're super protein, they're mechanic, uh, they're inflammatory, mechanical and biochemical outputs, and all this taken together, they influence uh, how your respiratory drive works. Um, and of course, if you're, again, if you're depressed in the respiratory drive, then you're likely uh, to, to, to have some a muscle atrophy. Now, I think that the, 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 there has been um, concerns over uh, diaphragm, diaphragm atrophy ever since 2004, when, when ventilator-induced diaphragmatic uh, uh, dysfunction has been described. Um, so I just uh, I brought two two papers, both by Golger, which which they showed, okay, perhaps like uh, not perhaps, but diaphragmatic atrophy it is an issue, and it is associated with uh, prolonged mechanical ventilation. This was the uh, an analysis of two hundred patients, and then later in two thousand nineteen, uh, they actually did this uh, the, the mediation analysis Golger. And, and, and colleagues where they saw that diaphragm thickness is associated with prolonged mechanical ventilation, complications with acute respiratory failure and uh, uh, increased uh, length of stay in the ICU. So after that comes the, the, the whole concept of lung and protective mechanical ventilation. And I think this connects really well with uh, uh, sedation and pain because at some level we want to uh, achieve a ventilator, uh, ventilator synchrony, but at uh, and and control with respiratory effort because we do know that excessive, uh, uh, or at least some believe that excessive uh, respiratory effort is is uh, um, detrimental to patients. But if you give a lot of sedation, if you treat it uh, very uh, uh, aggressively, and then you over sedate the patients, then you will have diaphragmatic weakness. So they came up with this. Uh, idea of achieving respiratory homeostasis, lung protection, diaphragm, diaphragm, diaphragm protection, so that we could improve patient outcomes. And, and so there comes like, uh, along with this strategy comes some uh, um, um, ideas to avoid uh, um, 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 excessive uh, respiratory efforts or uh, uh, diaphragm disuse, right? So Mari and colleagues, they tried putting patients, like they, they, they assessed the respiratory drive and the muscular, the muscular pressure in patients uh, uh, weaning from ECMO. And the more you sweep off CO2, the lesser, uh, the, the lower is the, the muscular pressure. Uh, Drew doing it at all, they proposed another strategy would be like, okay, let's keep the patients deeply sedated, but let's titrate a rock rolling infusion so that we can de de decrease the uh, uh, transpulmonary pressure. Um, earlier this year, we published this paper in anesthesiology where, okay, let's try blocking the phrenic nerve with a bolus of lidocaine. And we saw that the, we, we, we saw a reduction in pendulums in pigs, and we saw a reduction in driving pressure, not only in pigs, but also in humans. So this might be an alternative to avoid over sedation and to uh, um, achieve ventilator synchrony. Now, this was just a proof of concept study, but all of these studies are, 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 are uh, physiological studies uh, showing alternatives. Now, the last, last, thing, last thing I'm gonna talk about is about phrenic nerve stimulation. Back in 2016, uh, Reynolds and colleagues, they saw that uh, uh, if you stimulate and you try to synchronize the respiratory effort uh, with phrenic stimulation, you could increase uh, diaphragm thickness. And then earlier this year, Dress and colleagues they published this paper in the Blue Journal where they actually saw that uh, uh, diaphragm bracing did not reduce uh, uh, did not uh, reduce the, the, the mechanical the length of mechanical ventilation or did not increase the mechanical ventilation three days, but it all, but it did increase the maximum respiratory pressure. So again, uh, it's an alternative and perhaps this could be beneficial uh, in future trials. So this take home message is sedatives are, are the most common drug in the ICU. And there's a fine tuning between the desired effects and complications. So it's, it, we need to keep in mind that over sedation and over analgesia, they will have consequences for patients. I think that at some point we will, our shift will likely move to lung and diaphragm protective ventilation. This has become 
an issue lately that we need to address at some point. And, um, and I think that novel approaches, we need to, to at some point, um, start focusing on that. I don't know if we need to do more peripheral nerve block, do more phrenic nerve stimulation, or uh, perhaps um, um, try to investigate a bit more the effects of phrenic nerve block. Um, thank you very much.